Well, good afternoon to the over 200 subscribers who have joined us for today's webinar to talk about a very important issue, particularly for Victoria and New South Wales as we still battle our way through the lockdown restrictions that are currently in place. It's my great pleasure this morning, or this afternoon to welcome <coughs> Dee to, with us. Now, Dee is the founder of Law Squared, and Dee's gonna talk to us about the rent relief uh, opportunities, processes, protocols, et cetera, in Victoria and New South Wales. If you do have a question, can you put it in the Q&A box? And if Dee hasn't answered it when we get to the end of the presentation, we'll ask those questions separately. But welcome, Dee. I really appreciate you giving your time to us today. This is a really important issue. I know we've had many calls at Fitness Australia about this very subject and how our members can access it and find their way through, I guess, the, uh, the jungle of, of uh, protocols and red tape, et cetera. So look, really looking forward to what you're gonna be telling us. Thanks, Dee. Right. Thanks, Barry. Appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, obviously, it's a, a topic that is uh, high in everyone's mind and uh, people trying to work out how best to manage their landlord. And let's be honest, COVID sucks. It's absolutely ruined a number of um, businesses. Um, and obviously, particularly in the fitness industry, we see some huge challenges. So what I'm going to do today is go through a, a bit of a slide deck. There's probably kind of five or six slides. And then there's just a series of FAQs and I can already see some questions coming through, which is great. Um, let's get through those FAQs and let's see what questions have been answered. And then of course, happy to um, you know, take any other answers that might be in the Q&A chat box. Um, if there is any question that is a bit too specific, then happy to jump on a call after this um, with anyone to go through it. So again, this is about you learning and understanding what your rights are as a tenant and or landlord, if there are any in, um, on the call um, and really how we can help navigate this important to note that this is also going to be focused on Victoria and New South Wales. So if you are from another jurisdiction, uh, again, happy to chat after this, but the focus primarily is on Victoria and New South Wales. Let's get started. So again, this is just general uh, advice, kind of not tailored or specific, but really is just an overview of both the Victorian and New South Wales uh, rental relief regime at the moment. And it is absolutely current as of today as well. In terms of the agenda, we will go through an overview of the rental relief regime. Again, Victoria, New South Wales, some FAQs. I will share with you some resources um, that we've kind of put together at Law Squared, but also just the resources of the Victorian Small Business Commission and also the New South Wales Small Business Commission. Uh, and then of course, take any questions that people may have. All right, let's get started. As we know, again, COVID has absolutely destroyed a number of businesses and it's really impacted us globally. We might think it's a local issue where we have a series of lockdowns and um, you know, some might say draconian uh, rules imposed by governments, but absolutely and unfortunately has been a global issue. And while we have some other countries coming out of this better and quicker than we are, it is still impacting them across the board. The next challenge we have is that governments, federal and state are all dealing with things very differently. I mean, don't have to go through uh, and make this a political topic, but obviously there are lots of inconsistencies and that makes it hard for business owners, but also provides some opportunities for business owners because as we have seen, there are federal schemes in terms of how we can access some grants and opportunities. And similarly, there have been some state schemes which have allowed us to also access some additional funding. You know, some small businesses have been able to have quite a lot of access to some grant funding, which has been great. And some others, unfortunately, haven't been eligible. So. Hopefully this rental relief scheme, which again in Victoria and New South Wales, really is aimed to provide what the government determines as a, a fair deal between landlords and tenants. Unfortunately, last year when we went through this similar exercise, we saw a lot of landlords being very unreasonable. Um, I personally was a part of a number of mediations, uh, over about 100, um, with the small business commissioners in both Victoria and New South Wales, with very unreasonable landlords. And, Fortunately for tenants and unfortunately for landlords, you know, this is a tenant friendly scheme. Okay. So if you have a situation whereby landlords are absolutely digging their heels in, you know, know that you do have the rights and the power to seek rental relief. A quick comparison and looking at 2020 versus 2021, I'm going to assume that a number of you were in operation in 2020. And as a result of that, you were eligible for rental relief and uh, engaged in a series of um, negotiations and hopefully came to a resolution with your landlord. Um, unfortunately, the scheme has changed. So just because you were eligible in 2020 doesn't mean you are eligible in 2021. And that's something that a lot of businesses we've been dealing with are kind of struggling with. 
Again, as many of you will know, JobKeeper was absolutely a thing. It kept many businesses alive. We don't have JobKeeper this time around. And in the last time, 2020 that is, JobKeeper almost tied in eligibility. So if you were eligible for JobKeeper, you were automatically eligible for the rental relief regime. And this time around, it's not quite the same. And we will go through the various tests at both New South Wales and Victoria for you to understand whether you are eligible for rental relief. It's pretty safe to say though, if your business has been closed as a result of government direction, then the chances are pretty high that you are eligible for rental relief. So we are gonna focus on the 2021 um, regime. It's fair to say that if you didn't have access to, or if you didn't um, make an application for rental relief under the 2020 scheme, it is too late. Um, the rules are very prescriptive in terms of when an application must be made, and therefore 2020 you need to put behind you. No doubt a number of you are still paying deferrals from 2020, and we will touch on that. We have had a number of questions from people saying, can I renegotiate the deferrals from last year? Um, that is something that unfortunately isn't addressed directly in the schemes in that you are still required to pay that, but we will get there in terms of some of the questions that I can see coming through. So let's look at Victoria first, and then we'll move to New South Wales. Uh, in Victoria, the rental relief regime for 2021 only came in uh, in late August. However, it was backdated until the 28th of July. So that means therefore that businesses are entitled to rental relief regime from July through to the end of the year. Okay, so it gives about a six month um, window of opportunity um, in order to set in stone essentially what that rental relief piece might be. Um, an eligible lease is either a retail lease, a commercial lease or a license. Um, I see there is a question here around subleases that is also included. There's also a question that I've just seen pop up around licenses. So subleases, licenses, they are all eligible under the scheme. So depending on what type of arrangement you may have um, with your landlord, then so long as it is a retail lease, a commercial lease, a sublease or a license, then you ought to be an eligible lease under the Victorian regime. The hurdle in terms of an eligible tenant is whether you have a turnover of less than $50 million. And if you do have a turnover of less than $50 million and then meet the decline test, then absolutely you can make an application for rental relief to your landlord. Really important is that actually only yesterday, the day before, and the Victorian government has released some guidance for landlords. So landlords that do the right thing are entitled to land tax relief, but also they're entitled to grants. And that's something that came out last year in terms of a lot of landlords saying, well, I'm not getting anything. Why do I have to give up money and income that I um, should be getting from you as a tenant? Um, the government isn't giving me anything. This time around, the government is. The government did give land tax relief last time. This time, the Victorian government in particular has gone one step further. And so this is a further incentivization for landlords to absolutely comply because they will be entitled to land tax relief but also entitled to a grant. And it's about to about $6,000 from what I could see. That was only released, uh, like I said, two days ago, and we're still yet to see um, the rules around that, but it is good and certainly does give tenants, particularly in Victoria, some bargaining power to say to landlords, look, do the right thing, and you're also eligible for um, some additional land tax relief and a grant. So, as I mentioned earlier, if you're an eligible lease, we have an eligible lease, you're an eligible tenant if you A, make less than $50 million, and B, you meet one of the following tests. And put simply, a test is a decline in turnover test. You need to show that at least over a three month comparison period that you have had a decline in turnover. And there are four tests here, um, and I don't propose to go through each of them because they will be very different for the businesses. But know that the test will depend on when you commence trading. So if you launched a business pre-2020, there is one test available. If you launched a business in 2020, there is another test. And if you've launched a business since, or in 2021, then there is a separate test for you. It really does depend when you are trading and when you commence trading, and therefore you can apply the relevant test. One thing that's really important to note is any information that you provide to prove your decline in turnover test must be provided to the landlord, okay? It's not just good enough to say, well, my revenue over a three-month period in 2018, 2019 was X, Y, Z, and now in 2021, it's A, B, C. You must actually provide supporting documentation. And we will go through what some of that supporting documentation is because, again, we're seeing a lot of landlords push back 
a lot of landlords ask for information that they shouldn't be asking for, but also tenants not providing information that they should be providing. Importantly, that under both of these regimes with Victoria, New South Wales, and in fact, even under the national code last year, there was a strong obligation of good faith. And you know, we kind of look at good faith and say, yeah, I'll do the right thing, you do the right thing. But it does require you as a person seeking rental relief to act in absolute good faith, okay? So that means you must provide all the material that is entitled by the landlord to receive and to review and understanding that the landlord will likely send any information that you provide to them to their accountant to essentially approve it. Under the 2021 regime in Victoria, there is a requirement to provide all your financial documentation with a supporting statutory declaration. Again, that is because last year we saw a lot of tenants not be truthful and arguably fudge some numbers in order to get greater rent relief. Um, those who have had to sign a stat deck before might thinking, well, it's fine to sign a stat deck, but there are severe criminal penalties uh, and also civil fine penalties as a result of a false statutory declaration. So governments have realised that whilst most people are doing the right things, really requires everybody to do the right things. Otherwise, there is a concern there around some penalties. Calculating rental relief is not easy. I'm not going to pretend that it is, uh, and I certainly recommend working with your um, accountant or your bookkeeper uh, in order to determine the rental relief. What we have done at Law Squared is provide a rental relief calculator, and there's just a screen grab of what that looks like here. And you can see that the three tests each have separate tabs. So what we'll do after this um, webinar is share uh, this calculator and allows you to work with your accountant to fill it in. Um, and will then very nicely fit into a template letter to the landlord, which we have also prepared for businesses to use. This is being done as a community initiative. We want as many businesses to have access to rental relief requests as possible. We want as many businesses to survive in this crazy COVID world that we live in. And we certainly want to see lots more successes for businesses as we go through. So a couple of things to really important for our Victorian joiners today. Um, you have until the 30th of September to make a request for rental relief. That is a drop dead date. If you don't, then you're not entitled to the July, August component and September component of the rental relief. If you make a request for rental relief after September, then you're only entitled to any rental relief from the day that you make the rental relief application, okay? So really important that you start you know, in the next 15 or so days to put things into motion and make sure that your rental relief application is made before the 30th of September. You have 14 days from making an official request to your landlord to provide what is classified as a mandatory supporting information and a statutory declaration, as I mentioned before. And some of that mandatory supporting information is evidence of turnover figures from your accountant or your CFO, um, and again, a statutory declaration. Something that wasn't in last year's regulations, but is in this year's regulations, is the landlord and the tenant essentially have three goes at negotiating. And if you can't get it right at the third time, then you can make an application to the Small Business Commissioner in order for to, a mediation to be conducted and to see how you can see to have a resolution between landlord and tenant. And if, of course, it doesn't resolve, then you can go to VCAP. Now, I can say out of the 100 plus that I did last year, we only had one go to VCAP. So, there is a very high success rate at a mediation um, and important also to note and does get covered off in the FAQs is that if you are unable to come to a resolution with your landlord, if you have made a proper application and you have are in the process of mediation, then a landlord cannot evict you. A landlord cannot increase your rental. Um, it must essentially see out the process. So this process may not be completed until the end of the year or early next, and you will then, of course, be required to back pay whatever is ultimately agreed. But importantly to note, you essentially reserve your position and you ensure that there is no eviction possible from your premises until that process has been completed. But it does require you to make the application in time. This is a opt-in, not an opt-out process, okay? You as a tenant must opt-in to make an application to your landlord. So in terms of um, what is some of the information that you need to provide? I've just listed them on this slide. And again, we will share the slides um, at the end of this um, webinar. So don't worry about mad scrambling to write them down. But essentially, it's a statement of financial position, an outline of your income expenses, uh, a report or a letter from your accountant confirming the figures, um, and any other information that you think may be reasonable. Um, again, financial statements, P&L, balance sheet, 
We have had, oddly, requests from landlords to show your savings and or your bank account. That is not a reasonable request and not one that I recommend you follow, okay? It's irrespective of how much savings you have or what is in your bank account. It absolutely is reliant on your revenue and your decline in revenue over a set period of time in line with those rules, okay? So yes, there are some level of information that you must provide. On the opposite side, there is some information that you shouldn't provide and bank statements and evidence of savings is one of them. So it's a high level run through of Victoria, but hopefully it's pretty clear. Must make an application um, to the landlord by way of a letter before 30 September, 2021. You have 14 days to provide any supporting material if you don't provide it uh, at the same time as your letter, although we do recommend that you do. All supporting material must be accompanied by stat deck and you must be eligible uh, under both the lease as a tenant, but importantly for the decline in turnover test. Okay, so high level, but really they're the things you need to take away. So for anyone in Victoria, again, rental relief requests must be made by the 30th of September, eligible lease, decline in turnover, supporting material with a stat deck. Okay, so let's move across to New South Wales and it's actually much simpler in New South Wales, uh, funny enough. So rental relief was released in August and this is effective from the 13th of July, okay? So a little earlier than the Victorian regulations. Again, from memory, it's the 28th of July where the Victorian regulations kick in. This for New South Wales is from the 13th of July. That means if your business was impacted pre-July, then unfortunately you are not eligible to claim any rental relief from your landlord. Some landlords may, out of goodwill, decide that they want to apply it for a longer period. However, there is certainly no obligation for them to. In terms of um, how long it goes for, the rental relief period is from the 13th of July to the 13th of January. Okay, so it's an additional uh, month, so six months across the line. You can come to an arrangement with your landlord. So 13th of Jan July to 13th of January. An eligible lease is the same as a Victorian, so a retail lease, commercial lease, and a license. Different to our Victorian friends, the New South Wales one is in terms of eligible tenant is those who have received either the COVID-19 micro business grant, the COVID-19 business grant and or job saver payment, okay? So the decline in turnover test is not relevant in this situation because you will apply whatever test was applied in order for you to receive, again, the micro business grant, the business grant or the job saver payment. They're the key differences in terms of the two regulations. Victoria has an arguably quite complex arrangement in terms of how to decline so how to define that decline in revenue test as opposed to rental relief in New South Wales where it has tied it over to um, accessibility or eligibility to a grant. So to make that a bit clearer, it is similar to last year's mandatory code of conduct where if you were eligible for JobKeeper, then you were eligible uh, for rental relief. New South Wales has taken a similar based approach. Also very similar to what we mentioned earlier for Victoria, New South Wales too has land tax relief for landlords who do the right thing. Okay, so if a landlord does offer rental relief in line with the rules and um, you're able to come to a successful negotiation and settlement on that, then they are entitled to land tax relief, which is a big bonus for landlords as well. So that was a run through, um, but the common themes remain in that a rental relief request must be made in writing. For Victoria, you specifically have until the 30th September to make that in order to be eligible earlier. You must be an eligible tenant uh, under both regimes. You must have an eligible lease under both regimes. You must provide mandatory supporting documentation under both regimes. Um, again, as part of our post webinar um, information that we'll provide will be a template letter for both New South Wales and Victoria and that calculator so you can easily plug in that information. What I'll do now is just go through some FAQs uh, and then I can see there's about 23 uh, questions already. So we'll hopefully tuck into them uh, in the 20 or so minutes that we'll have left. So pretty simple one is, does my landlord have to offer rental relief? Simple answer is yes. If you meet the criteria that we just said, then it's a non-negotiable. Landlords must offer you rental relief. If you're an eligible business, an eligible lease, uh, and you've had that decline in turnover and or you are eligible for one of those government grants. 
there's been a couple of questions here around outgoings and you know does the gym or studio um or any fitness business that might be here today which has been closed by government direction do you still need to pay outgoings outgoings as we know are cost reasonably incurred by a landlord and are passed on in line with your lease obligations each state has dealt with this differently however pretty commonly across the board it is if the landlord has incurred the outgoing then the tenant often incurs that outgoing as well if the landlord however has not incurred that outgoing then it should not be passed on to the tenant so it's not quite a yes or no answer and we know that for example electricity companies water companies councils and rates are offering reduced outgoings uh, also reduced rates and therefore they are fees that must be passed on to the tenant you can of course negotiate with your landlord in terms of how you pay these outgoings because I know for some businesses they are quite excessive um, and that can certainly form part of any payment arrangement that you might come to with your um, with your landlord but it's important to know that if the landlord has incurred that then whilst there is an obligation for the landlord to consider passing that on or not there is certainly not an obligation for them not to okay so an important distinction to ensure that the landlord has actively incurred those outgoings and if so then there may be a requirement for you as a tenant to pay for those outgoings. In terms of rental relief, does it only apply to leases? It does, but again, leases can come in many forms. You can be the head lessee, you can be a sub lessee, you can operate under a license. Um, any three of those combinations will give you access to the rental relief. Had a few key landlords try to negotiate month to month. Uh, and that is that they say, well, okay, you've been shut since June, July, August, September, but from October you can open, therefore we're going to reassess at that time. An agreement should be in place for the entire period covered under the schemes of the regulations. Okay, so if it's from July to January, then you should be coming up with an arrangement from July to January. Um, similar July to December, you should be coming up with a period for the entire time. And the reason why we say that is because it gives you cost certainty in terms of any costs you're going to be incurring immediately, but also any costs you're going to have to defer for a future date. Um, and then also for the landlord, they understand their own cash flow position. So when they are making an application for a grant or for land tax relief, they too can understand that if you're paying 25% of the lease, then of course they can cash flow manage that. So. You shouldn't be doing month to month. It should absolutely be for the entire period covered under the schemes. In terms of grants and government subsidies. So again, we said this early on in the piece, um, absolutely a number of businesses have been eligible for grants and government subsidies. And in New South Wales, it is a requirement for you to be um, eligible for one of those grants to then be eligible for rental relief. And so, yes, you do need to declare them. You don't declare them as income, though. You just declare them as grants received. Okay, so two separate things, something that you can work with uh, on with your accountant, of course, or your CFO. But really important to know um, that the grant should be declared. I did allude to this earlier in terms of landlords trying to evict for non-payment of rent um, during COVID. They can only not evict you if you've made a, an application and an application in line with the regulations, which is what we've spoken about today, and certainly an application in line with um, the letter which we will provide at the end of this webinar. Okay, so once you've made an application for rental relief, then it essentially forbids a landlord from either seeking to increase your rent and or evicting you for non-payment. Okay, so really important to know we have seen a few notices of defaults being issued um, by landlords seems rather premature. I don't think a landlord is going to have the opportunity to get anybody else in there, given the current economic climate we operate in. But really important to note that absolutely they cannot do so. And if you are served with a notice of default, then doing something about that pretty quickly is important. Um, again, both the Victorian Small Business Commission and the New South Wales um, Small Business Commission uh, are really helpful about that. They both have a mediation process, which you can um, activate and certainly um, is free and is covered by both state governments. The only caveat to that question is um, a landlord who seeks to evict you for other issues, but if it's non-payment um, for your outgoings and or your um, rental, then that is a no. But if there are other breaches of a lease, then that is not covered under COVID regulations, okay? So um, just something to bear in mind. 
In terms of rental uh, increases, uh, absolutely not. So there is a freeze in all rental increases during the COVID period. Um, you may have been subject to a rental increase earlier this year. Um, unfortunately, there is nothing we can do about that. But certainly if there is a rental increase due between July and January, then those rental increases should not be carried through and the landlord will have to wait until there is a post-COVID period in order for them to make that increase. You may want to, as part of your negotiations with the landlord, renegotiate that aspect um, given the COVID environment. It really does depend on the relationship that you have with the landlord and certainly the landlord's agent. Many of these conversations are happening through agents rather than landlords direct. Um, but certainly there is no obligation for them to you know, freeze rental relief forever. Um, it really only is for the COVID period. Next question is around, yeah, bank account and savings. And as I said before, so you should not be providing uh, evidence of bank accounts and savings to um, your um, landlord. And absolutely it's irrelevant to your request for rental relief. If you had a decline in turnover, um, decline in revenue, then that is the trigger point for you to have um, eligibility for rental relief, irrespective of the amount of money you may have in the bank. What if the landlord doesn't agree? So we've had a, land, a few landlords just completely refuse. Well, then unfortunately you are left with no alternative but to make an application to the Small Business Commission. So um, again, so long as you have done all the right things, you've made your rental relief application in line with um, the rules, then you've done the right thing, you can see it through. You can file the application by virtue of sending it to your landlord and or its agent. Within 14 days, provide the mandatory supporting documentation. You have three goes at negotiations between yourself and the landlord. If you can't get anywhere, then you bring an application to the Small Business Commission. Um, they really are the steps that you need to go through in order to ensure that you've protected your position as a tenant, okay? And hopefully keep your business in that location moving forward and certainly in a post-COVID world. The last FAQ that I've got before we kind of go to questions and resources is really around renegotiating deferral payments. So as we know, under the 2020 rules, um, there was a 50% waiver, 50% deferral, um, and that deferral was to be paid over a 24 month period or over the remaining period of the lease if that was more than 24 months. So some of you may be paying two, three, four hundred dollars or more in deferrals at the moment on a monthly basis or a four ninety basis, depending on how your lease cycle is. Um, unfortunately, there is no allowance to renegotiate that deferral, but again, there's no reason why you can't ask for it, okay? If you are in a revenue negative position in terms of not making any money during these lockdowns, then you can absolutely seek to try and renegotiate that with your landlord. Um, and that's going to be a really important thing to do, as I understand, again, it's a really cash flow issue for many fitness businesses at the moment. In terms of resources, um, I've mentioned a few today and we will share them at the end of this webinar. It's a template letter for um, any Victorian tenants to send to their landlord. Um, it's a template letter for New South Wales. We also have the Victorian Rental Relief Calculator and a fact sheet for Victoria, but really we'll just cover off most of the things that I have spoken about today. Um, there are both links there for the Victorian Small Business Commission and also the New South Wales um, Small Business Commission. They're really helpful resources. There's a lot of information there um, and they both have helplines. So if you do have any direct queries and you know, either can't get through to um, myself or you know, anyone else to give you those insights, then certainly both those helplines in Victoria and New South Wales, particularly once you get to the pointy end of not being able to negotiate any further with your landlord, will be really helpful and certainly something that I absolutely encourage. So there's been a lot of information in 30 minutes. Uh, so thanks for bearing with me and hearing my voice, but happy to take any questions now and might pass over to Barry to kind of uh, see this through. Really, again, it's important that you as a tenant remember that you've got some rights and you have some responsibilities as well. And those responsibilities are to absolutely make a rental relief request in line with the rules. And if you do so, then you can obviously follow the course. But again, it's an opt-in process, not an opt-out process. The onus is on you to take the steps to negotiate with your landlord. It is not on your landlord to come to you. And that's a really important point really to finish off on before we head to any additional questions. Thanks, Steve. Thanks so much for that. And there are a few questions which we'll get into at the moment in the Q&A box. Just a couple, I guess, which have got a bit of urgency coming up for New South Wales um, and then possibly after this Sunday, Victoria as well. 
what's the situation uh, when we get to here in New South Wales, when we get a 70% vaccination rate? Now, I'm not interested in anti-vax or pro-vaccination, whatever, but it, can a landlord say, look, it's okay, you can now open, the government has said you can. A business may choose not to for a number of reasons. It could not be viable uh, from a commercial point of view. They may have a very strong view on vaccinations and so on. Yeah. But can the landlord yeah. turn and say, well, you can operate, therefore your concessions are now out the door, even if you choose not to operate? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And we had that, uh, particularly with restaurants who um, didn't opt in to do Deliveroo or Uber Eats or any of those um, gateways. Absolutely the business's choice as to how they operate. If, of course, there are no restrictions and the businesses choose to not reopen or is unable to, then that is a different story. But I, under any circumstances where there are restrictions, it is the business, again, to opt into how it wishes to operate. So, you know, a landlord could be saying, well, you could be running online classes and therefore those online classes could generate you revenue. That revenue can then be paid to me. It is not for the landlord to tell you how to run your business. Um, it is for you. But certainly whilst there's any period of um, restrictions in place, then yes, um, you have the final say. But if you know, New South Wales or Victoria to say, right, all rules are off, we're back to normal, and you then were to choose to say, no, I'm yet not comfortable, then that is a challenge. Uh, and I could suspect many landlords will be successful in not offering rental relief, particularly for those later periods. So you may be eligible for, say, July, August and September, but say from October, if rules were to change and say, right, all bets are off, then you would struggle to be eligible for rental relief for that period. Okay, so when we get to the 70% business, there are still restrictions for non-vaccinated people and therefore those businesses are subject to restrictions, therefore the landlord, yep, okay. Yeah. The, other, the other question that came to me when you were reinforcing the importance of the 30th of September date and getting those applications lodged, do they have to be fully completed with a lodgement or can you, if you're waiting on, a, say, a statement from your accountant, and it doesn't come until after the 30th, can you start the process or do you have you can, to? can, absolutely. Yeah, so the, the requirement is the letter to be issued and then the supporting documentation in Victoria to be provided within 14 days thereafter. So, so long as you've made a formal request before the 30th of September, then you are eligible for, to say, the pre-September um, rental relief as well. Okay, let's start going through these uh, questions then. Can you recommend, or oh, here's the hard one for you, can you recommend respectful way of negotiating the tricky periods with both agents and landlords? Yeah, I would rely on that good faith provision. And, you know, we, not that we always like to throw good faith as lawyers, but ultimately there's a couple of things that landlords need to realise. One, you're a small business. You want to survive and you want to be a good tenant. You have to essentially pitch to the landlord as to why you're a good tenant and why it's going to be hard for them to replace you. Some income is better than none. And certainly a lot of the discussions that we've raised um, with landlords has been around that sentiment. One, they have an obligation of good faith. Your business failing is not a good thing for them because they won't have a tenant. In the current climate, it's gonna be very hard for them to refit out the premises um, or re-lease out the premises, and that's a challenge. And show a commitment in terms of you're willing to see this through and you wanna to continue to grow your business, therefore you wanna build a good relationship with them. They're really the three or four things that I would be putting uh, in terms of how to actively negotiate in a positive way, as opposed to a, a negative way, sharing, I suppose, the future success for both. If you're successful as a business, they're successful as a landlord because they've got a tenant in there. That really is the message that you need to get across. Yeah, and the worst thing is a vacant building. Yeah. Um, question from Joe, how can I go about getting relief on my outgoings with my outgoings, if that makes yeah. sense? It's a challenge. So again, Victoria and New South Wales have dealt with this differently. I understand that Victoria has given some rental relief specifically for gyms. So in terms of outgoings, there is um, a very specific allowance for outgoings to not be charged to gym premises. Um, so that's something to be aware of. And there's certainly more information on that specific point in the Victorian Small Business Commission. But if it's a outgoing incurred by a landlord, then again, it's a pretty hard slog to say, well, actually, we're not going to pay this either. Um, you can certainly try and negotiate it using all those same points that I raised before, um, but certainly there is no positive obligation in other jurisdictions for a landlord to waive the outgoings. What you can do, though, is seek to defer them. And so whilst it not be an ideal situation, you could say, look, our, our revenue is just not there. And we expect, based on a cash flow model forecast and based on the open rates um, that 
you know, certain trigger points will occur and therefore we will have certain revenue. Um, at that point, we might be in a position to pay our outgoings. The thing you've got to think about when making your landlord request for rental relief is you have to offer the landlord some form of certainty in terms of the amount of money that they will receive as well. And that's really what it is. Um, landlords just don't want to not get anything. I know that you as a, as, a, as a business don't want to pay not anything, but it's about offering them something. Um, Sometimes we've had in the past people who just offer a, a lump sum payment. So they say, right, we'll pay you a couple of thousand dollars to just cover the outgoings and you wear the rest. Um, there is no just kind of cut and dry way. So one way or another, it really does come down to a negotiation. You have some landlords who are really kind and caring and understanding and are in a financial position to actually wear some of these costs. You have other landlords, this may be their first investment. You know, this may be something that actually they are not full cash, you know, flush with cash. Um, they too have a mortgage and they too are defaulting. So we kind of got to see both ends of the spectrum there. Okay, next question. If you have been on a long-term monthly tenancy, why is this considered an ineligible lease for purposes of negotiating rent relief? Is rent paid ineligible for landlord for income tax purposes? Yeah, so... Good question. So land tax needs to show certainty over a period of time. And so when there isn't a period of time, then that makes it tricky. What you could do on your month to month, if that is the case, is seek to negotiate with your landlord to go into a longer period lease. You may not want to do that, but therefore you may not be eligible for the rental relief. But it comes back down to the other, just because you're not an eligible tenant, doesn't mean you still can't make a request to the landlord and doesn't mean the landlord still doesn't need to negotiate. Um, really important whilst there is that distinction between ineligible and eligible, you could still as a business bring an application to the Small Business Commission. Um, that is mandatory for a landlord to attend, even if you are not an eligible um, tenant under the regulations. Because again, in the spirit of why these things exist, it is to see businesses survive in a post-COVID world, okay? So that's you know, a suggestion perhaps where you might wanna think about, okay, entering into a six month lease or a 12 month lease, on the basis of certain rental relief conditions being met, um, that will give both the landlord the incentive from a land tax relief perspective, but also make the landlord eligible for the grant um, and therefore will also give you the rental relief. Okay, one from Scott. Can you please advise what payment landlords in New South Wales are eligible for if they are not eligible for land tax relief or if their main source of income is not from property leasing? Yeah, so in terms of payment arrangement, uh, again, the split is 50% waived, 50% deferred, and you pay the um, balance of whatever your revenue might be. Assuming your revenue is zero at this time, then again, you just pay the 50%. Um, so that's the first piece. Um, in, in terms of ineligibility for the, the landlord, and if the landlord is the one who is required uh, or relying on that income, unfortunately, that's a matter for the landlord to consider. If you are an eligible tenant, then they still must offer you um, rental relief uh, in line with the regulations. And this is where I made that comment earlier around, sometimes this is landlord's first investment opportunity. One thing we have seen um, landlords do, and again, this is an active thing the landlord must do, is go to their bank and say, look, this is an investment property. I've got a mortgage, I'm unable to pay it. And we are seeing banks give uh, you know, kind of mortgage holidays. So up to a six month period of time, banks are doing that. So. Not that you want to tell your landlord what to do, but you can certainly encourage them and show them some of the options that are available, which include, you know, seeing if they're eligible for a grant, seeing if they are or not eligible for land tax relief, but also speaking to their own financiers around what are some relief that they can provide the landlord, which the landlord in then can provide to you. Okay, in New South Wales, what are the requirements for showing financials as we will be <coughs> signing a new lease soon? and would prefer to keep as much data confidential as possible. Yeah, so it is the same uh, pretty much list that I had up there for Victoria. So um, statement of financial position, balance sheet, profit and loss, um, you know, really information that you can extract from say your zero or your my of account is what you should be providing to show that revenue decline. Um, and certainly if you are going to enter into a new lease with either the same or a different landlord, then they will be able to ask for the same financial documents. So just as now when you're making an application for a new lease, they will still ask for your statement of financial position. Um, that is not an unreasonable request for a landlord to ensure that you actually have the funds in order to meet your lease obligations. Um, yeah. Okay, 
uh, if it's too late for us to submit an application to SBB for rent relief in 2020, does this mean it's also too late for the agent to now try and recoup money from the same rent money from the same period? No, unfortunately not. Um, if you were eligible but didn't opt in, again, this is an opt-in process, both in 2020 and 2021, um, then you may be liable to pay for the full rent for 2020. Again, what you can try and do is bundle in your request, again, relying on that good faith provision, um, and asking the landlord to consider a payment plan for that. But there is certainly no obligation on a landlord to give you ongoing rental relief for a period that you should have provided um, your application in 2020. Yeah, that is an unfortunate thing, um, but unfortunately that's kind of where it sits. Okay, from Chris, my landlord has frozen my rent since the 28th of July this year. I did not send him a letter. Do I need to backdate the letter to him so he can get a grant? Uh, you don't need to backdate it. Um, you could date it today and they're still eligible um, for it. All that land tax, um, either Victoria or um, Judy's New South Wales require to see is that rental relief has been given. That's what's really important. And so once they've met that criteria, then they're eligible. Um, both states have a land tax form, which tenants actually must sign. So um, so long as you're able to sign that, then there should be no issue in terms of the landlord getting that rental relief. Uh, sorry, that land tax relief. Okay, uh, are lockdown periods without rent relief claimable through the business interruption insurance? Million dollar question. Um, so as you're probably all aware, there is a number of uh, claims at the moment um, against various insurers. There is one against Ansevar, there is one against QBE um, from various different gyms uh, primarily um, and fitness businesses. So um, at the moment, most business interruption insurances have been voided uh, and that is that they did not cover a pandemic. Um, not here to give advice on business interruption insurance and whether um, your policy covers pandemic or not. Um, if it does, then there is something there that you could go back to your insurer with or otherwise to your insurance broker. But um, we certainly haven't seen many, if any, insurers pay out under business interruption insurance. But, you know, I suppose the question is wait and see because there are a couple of large challenges happening at the moment which may determine what that business interruption piece may be for small businesses. Not only fitness businesses, but most small businesses. I think the, the original um, claim against not being covered was uh, supported by the courts and the insurers are going back to challenge that particular yeah. claim as I understand it. Yeah. Uh, so there may, be, um, there may be relief coming through depending on what the court decides the second time around. Yeah. Um, and also, I, I'd agree with you, check your terms and conditions because it may be that the insurance policy wasn't updated in the last two or three years and you may actually have cover there. So go back and check it. Yeah, some policies do cover pandemic. Um, other policies did not. Um, there are, as you say, one determination by court already, um, but that was only limited scope. So even if the insurers fail in their next attempt, there's only a very limited scope of wording for that. There are, as I said, two others that I'm aware of, quite large actions, um, which will actually be a bit more determinative in terms of that definition for um, pandemic policy and whether it's covered under the business interruption insurance or not. But, you know, my initial feeling is that it won't be, but, you know, let's wait and see. Uh, and also just, Coralie, if you're still watching, put your question back up because I was going to come to it. I just want to leave it to the end. Uh, the last one we have at the moment is, as part of securing a lease in March 21, I had four months rent free, but also paid five months rent up front, taking me through to January next year. Am I still entitled to rent relief applied to future payments? Yeah, still entitled to rental relief and can apply to future payments. Again, you still need to make the request in line with the rules. Okay, um, well, I'm just waiting to see if Coralie puts a question back up. Obviously, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Dee, you have, from your aunt, there's considerable experience in this area. Can you just tell us a bit about your own background and, and a little bit about, um, you know, Law Squared as well? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, my background is commercial insurance litigation lawyer. Um, I started the business when uh, I started Law Squared six years ago. We now have a team of 35, uh, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, working primarily with businesses uh, from scale up growth businesses all the way through to listed and multinational companies. Four core areas of practice, so commercial, corporate, litigation, and employment. Um, so we will cover anything an employer's need. So across, um, you know, hiring, managing, and firing of employees. Uh, we certainly assist in drafting any terms, conditions, templates, intellectual property, privacy, data, cybersecurity, and of course any transactional work uh, that our corporate team will do. Um, but before starting my own business, I um, 
was a commercial litigator. I worked um, for insurance companies largely um, in national law firms um, doing a whole bunch of uh, insurance work. So that business interruption one is obviously something that I'm uh, across and familiar with and interested to see where that goes. So, so yeah, from my perspective, um, this is an initiative that we as a team have put together in order to support small businesses because we know how tough it is. Um, I did see there was a comment around kind of, you know, vaccines and policies and you know, it's all very topical at the moment and, you know, we trying our best to help businesses navigate what is otherwise a pretty messy time. But, you know, hopefully these resources can be used to really help you, know, you lead the way without the need to incur legal costs. You know, our hope is that you can actively negotiate from the start to end without having to need a lawyer or anyone else to support you. And know that if you do need support, then certainly the Victorian Small Business Commissioner and the New South Wales Small um, Business Commission will be able to assist, certainly from a mediation perspective. If you need support in the mediation, then absolutely let us know, happy to help. But otherwise, really, the tools are there for you to negotiate from start to end by yourselves. Okay, I'm just going to try and find this question because Kylie's put it back up again. Um, this is really off topic a little bit, but it's one that I know is going to be coming up more and more. And there's a, a comment in the um, in the chat room there about uh, us running a seminar soon on vaccination rulings. We will do that. So thank you, Lisa. But the question that's um, come up uh, basically, D, is when we're allowed to reopen, would it be acceptable to announce to members that all members need to be double vaccinated for entry into our gym? Yeah, it's a really topical one, obviously, and um, we're doing a lot of work around this, but we've seen businesses come out, you know, very large businesses. Um, we've seen Qantas say that you must be double vaccinated in order to be flying, um, and again, so yes, you can. Ultimately, you as a business owner get to decide. Um, there is obviously a discrimination question there, which is still lingering, and we're unsure where that will sit, but you know, in what is a pretty heightened sense at the moment, in order to protect, you know, we just saw today in New South Wales, 80% um, of our 80% um, of New South Wales people have uh, been vaccinated. So it's certainly the majority of people are, are going ahead and being vaccinated. And it is your choice at this point to kind of say, actually, if we are going to open in line with the rules, then the rules require us to have double vaccination, both of our employees and also of our members. So something that you can do, again, it is a not settled topic. So we say that today. However, um, you know, the Discrimination Commission may come out and suggest otherwise, but in line with what many other businesses are doing, such as Qantas and others, where they are saying there is a requirement for both staff, employees, and or customers or clients to be double vaccinated, then yes, that's something that businesses can also decide to do. The yeah, only so take it, sorry, to that will be, you know, having a very clear policy around um, what the business's position is. And, at this point, it should be an encouragement position. So, you know, we encourage our members or we encourage um, our staff to be vaccinated. Um, that would be the message that I'd suggest. Yeah, and we will be running a webinar on this very issue because it's very contentious. It's really all Sorry. kinds of views. Um, D, just one other question that I've got, uh, which you may or may not have a, an opinion on. Um, health directives from governments, do they, are they legal, are they legally enforceable? Say that again. Health, health, health directives from yeah. <laughs> from state governments. Yeah, largely yes. Uh, I mean, governments are given emergency powers, and certainly we've seen lots of discussion around state of emergencies and um, what rules and not rules are made around that. Um, we have seen a number of courts here in Victoria certainly um, impose um, some large fines uh, on businesses. So even if the health directive, let's say you're fined for keeping your gym open or you know having somebody there, etc. You may seek to challenge that, but we are seeing courts seek to enforce that. And it is for you know the greater good, I suppose, that um, courts are taking that measure. Um, it's not to say that there aren't some that haven't that have been challenged successfully, but it's a bit early to tell. I think um, most of the fines that have been issued um, or health directive orders that have been issued um, are yet to be contested. Um, people are just simply not paying them, uh, and therefore will end up in court eventually. Um, so it's still yet to, like I said, be tried, but. We have seen a couple uh, whereby health directors have been ordered for hotel quarantine. So people who are stuck in hotel quarantine who have tried to leave, um, but they are obviously subject to a health order. Um, we have seen courts, you know, under interlocutory applications, agree that the health order remain um, and therefore that that person remain in quarantine. So if we take that as a bit of a guide, then it looks to me that they are relatively enforceable. Thanks, Dee. And look, uh, I think we might finish that conversation there before we get uh, tied up in a in a very uh, emotional. Let it go back. 
Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting situation. It really is one which is unfolding on a day to day basis. I think, yeah, absolutely. I, like you, I believe there will be some directions coming out because these questions about where do you where do your rights start and finish are very confusing for everybody concerned. But anyway, I found that uh, today incredibly um, informative. And looking through the chat room, obviously, so many of our participants have as well. Really appreciate um, your time, Dee. Uh, and really appreciate you giving us your information and sharing those resources with us and, and uh, your expertise. It's been just fantastic. Thanks very much, yeah, again. And uh, thanks for thanks all so those participants. Yeah, thanks everyone. And thanks for participating in all of your questions. Really appreciate it. And um, yeah, hopefully it goes a little way to help businesses stay on track. Thanks again, Dee. You, you take care and stay safe. Yeah, thanks so much, Barry. Thanks. Cheers.